Lorenz was concerned with sport as a context where precisely on account of its roughness, its violence, the physical and psychological challenges that it involves as a result of its violence, as a result of its competitive character. Precisely because of these things, Lorenz argued that it's a useful context for people to learn to exercise self-control. And it's useful as a context in this regard, he, he argued, because lapses in self-control are immediately and severely punished. He also alluded to what he called the educational value of the demands made in sport for fairness and chivalry. Demands which are made even in the face of what he called the strongest aggression eliciting stimuli. In other words, being punched and hurt. You have to be exercise fair play, chivalry and self-control in, in those contexts. So because of its violence, it's useful according to Lorentz. In other words, Lorentz proposed a theory which is in part sociological or socio-cultural. Theory which implied that because they're learned, such features of sport as the values of fairness and chivalry depend on socialization and proper teaching and can also fall into, into abeyance. They're not something that as it sort of um, uh, grows automatically out of sport without active intervention. Now, in fact, there's evidence which suggests that inappropriate aggression and violence are more likely to occur in some sports than in others. The um, sociologists Roger Rees, John Howell and Andrew Miracle, Roger Rees is an Englishman, the other two are Americans, um, uh, they all work in America, but these three showed in 1990, for example, that when provoked, participants in contact sports are considerably more likely to respond aggressively than are participants in non-contact sports. Other research suggests that aggression may be, or may be believed to be, an effective success-enhancing strategy, particularly when applied early in a context. Or, um, the research suggests that uh, aggressiveness may be, or again, may be believed to be, effective as a reaction to failure. Experimental uh, research on the martial art uh, taekwondo ca carried out by an American uh, uh, called Trulson in 1986 is very interesting. In fact, it seems to provide support for uh, this aspect of Lorentz's theory. Uh, in one experiment that he carried out, um, uh, Trulson got a group of 13 to 17 year old males all of whom had been classified as delinquent. And he divided them into three groups, matched on levels of aggression and personality adjustment. Yeah, I mean, each group had as many um, psychopaths as the others, and, and, and as many uh, uh, delinquents who were you know, decent, ordinary people. They were matched in the senses. And the first of these groups was given traditional instruction in Taekwondo, that's to say, um, in its proper Korean sense, including a training in its philosophical component. Especially involved in this connection was a threefold stress on, firstly, responsibility, secondly, on the building up of self-confidence and self-esteem, and thirdly, on the uh, expression of respect for others. Physical skills and meditation were included as well. Members of the second group were required to practice a more modern form of Taekwondo and were taught only the fighting and self-defense self elements of the sport. The third group, by contrast, were given no martial arts training at all, but instead played basketball and American football. And Chulson's findings run, run counter to what the behaviorist research on these issues would lead you to expect. More particularly, after six months, the youth in the first group showed lower levels of aggression. Those in the second group showed higher levels of aggression. And those in the third group showed no change. It would be interesting, I think, to see if results similar to those achieved for the first of Trulson's group would be obtained in sports like soccer if players uh, were instructed in the amateur code of the old Corinthians, a code 
which stressed fair play and gentlemanly behaviour, and which was in that respect similar to the ethos of the Eastern martial arts. By the way, interestingly, uh, as an aside, when the pen penalty kick was first introduced into soccer in the 1890s, the, uh, if they were awarded a penalty, the Corinthians uh, used to kick the, wa the ball wide. Uh, they argued that gentlemen didn't break the rules or cheat deliberately, and that they didn't want to take advantage of the application of the new rule. They assumed, in other words, that their opponents were gentlemen and didn't wish to cheat. Uh, but let me get back to the um, main thrust of my argument. Where the standard behaviourist studies of sport and catharsis seem to me to go astray, then, is because they work with an overly simple reductionist mechanistic ahistorical and insufficiently sociological that's to say insufficiently relational model of human behavior. Let me repeat that. The behaviorist studies of sport and catharsis I think go wrong because they involve an overly simple, a reductionist, a mechanistic, ahistorical, and insufficiently relational that's to say, sociological model of human behavior. This leads uh, the people who adhere to this kind of theory, ignoring or underplaying the element of active choice. They treat humans as if they were similar to reactive chemicals and expect catharsis to be experienced independently on the one hand of people's aims, beliefs, values and their socialization and their training and on the other hand they expect it to occur independently of the socio-historical context that's being talked about. Related to this they conceptualize sport as a tension releasing, a tension reducing activity rather than seeing it as what Elias and I argued is an activity that's tension arousing, that it's concerned with emotional arousal, that it's concerned with the generation of excitement. That's the old Arist Aristotelian theory of catharsis. Um, uh, uh, they don't think in terms of pleasurable tension arousal in this connection. They just think in terms of tension release, tension reduction, in some kind of automatic sense. And in addition, they fail to appreciate that one of the keys to catharsis through sport, as Lorentz saw it, has to be the consistent instruction of both players and spectators in the ethos of fair play. And the need for this ethos to be kept alive and active if sport is to fulfill its apparently contradictory function of being friendly rivalry, of being non-hostile competition or conflict. Players and spectators also need consistent training from an early age in the importance of abiding by the rules, in the importance of following placatory rituals, such as shaking hands or uh, hands with or clapping your opponents in obeying match officials and above all in valuing the opponents because without them the enjoyable play fight that sport is at its, at its best would be impossible but above all a key in this regard is socialization and habituation in the exercise of self-control in fact as we've seen, Lorentz seems to have regarded physically aggressive sports like boxing 
as particularly valuable vehicles for teaching self-control precisely because given their violent aggressive component they can teach you they can provide you the opportunity for you to be taught that in order to maximize your chances of winning it's essential to keep your cool it's of course this ethos and the related pattern of socialization which have fallen into abeyance in much of modern sport especially at the top level where in conjunction with commercialization professionalization and media fed uh, national rivalries that achievement striving and an orientation towards seeking victory at all costs have been raised to the status of core values with deleterious consequences not only for top level sport itself but also downwards in the hierarchy of sporting success because of course top level sports persons act as role models now my attempt at correcting a currently dominant view in the field of sports studies should not be regarded as an expression of anything other than support for one part the sociological, socio socio-cultural part of Lorentz's theory. As far as humans are concerned, perhaps not other animals, but as far as humans are concerned, the psychological parts of his theory are, in my opinion, dubious. <coughs> Especially the idea which Lorentz shared, for example, with Freud, um, that humans have an aggressive instinct. Um, you won't find it surprising for me to suggest that Norbert Elias, writing in 1988, has written persuasively on this issue. The idea that humans have an innate, an innate aggressive drive which structurally resembles the sex drive, says Elias, is a false way of posing the problem. What we do have, and I quote, is an innate potential to shift our whole physical apparatus to a different gear if we feel endangered. This is the so-called fight-flight mechanism, the mechanism through which the human body reacts to danger by an automatic adjustment which prepares the way for intensive movement of the skeletal muscles, um, which prepares you for combat or flight. What's basically involved is the pumping of adrenaline through the body. According to Elias, human drives like the hunger drive or the sex drive are released physiologically. As he puts it, relatively independently of the actual situation in which people find themselves. They're at one level, recurring bodily processes. Your sexual need uh, uh, is, is aroused even if you're on your own, say in a prison cell, um, whether you're, you're, uh, you see um, uh, um, sexually arousing females, um, or if, if you're female sexually arousing males or not. Uh, the, the, this is something which is bodily aroused. By contrast, the shifting of uh, what Elias calls the body economy, the bodily system, if you like, uh, and I quote, to combat or flight readiness is conditioned to a far greater extent by a specific situation, whether present or remembered. Such situations can be natural, for example, being attacked by a wild animal. Um, uh, they can be based on memory uh, from a, an experience of encountering a snake or a spider as a child for example, or, or seeing a frightening um, uh, event with a spider or a snake or an alligator uh, in a film as a child. Um, but above all, um, uh, uh, it's conflict which uh, uh, triggers these situations. In conscious opposition to Lorentz and people like Freud who ascribed the aggression drive to people on the model of the sexual drive, drive, it's not, says Elias, and I quote, aggressiveness that triggers conflict, but conflicts that trigger aggressiveness. Let me repeat that. According to Elias, it's not aggressiveness that triggers conflict, but on the contrary, 
conflicts that trigger aggressiveness. <coughs> now, of course, there's a degree of rhetorical exaggeration in this. <clears throat> Elias would not have denied that some human conflicts derive from the disruptiveness of aggressive individuals. Nor would he have denied that in some cases the aggressiveness of disruptive individuals has psychological roots. It's uh, uh, possible even that um, uh, at, at, to some degree and in some cases the roots might be genetic. We wouldn't deny such possibilities. Um, um, but Elias also stressed the interdependence of the different human drives. In other words, he was aware of the in interconnectedness, interconnectedness of the sex, hunger and thirst drives and aggression, particularly if these drives are frustrated. You're more likely to be uh, uh, aggressive if you're sexually frustrated, or if you're hungry or thirsty, than if you're satiated or satisfied in all of these um, regards, regards. What Elias wanted above all to do was to counter the crude psychological reductionism that's involved in the notion of an aggressive instinct. So, summing up, it was Elias' conten contention that whether the fight-flight mechanism is directed into fighting or into fleeing, running away, is fundamentally a question of culture and social learning. More particularly, it's a question, according to Elias, of the degree to which the values of the society or group into which you're born or of which you later become a member, for example, through immigration, lay stress on the physically violent as opposed to the peaceful end of the continuum between extremely violent and wholly peaceful means of handling tensions and conflicts. At the violent end of the continuum, what appears to be involved is learning to enjoy the adrenaline rush. 